Good morning. Um, they always say surround yourself with greatness. We have had a baroness, we've had a professor, and now you have a hacker, so apologies. Um, my name is Daniel Cuthbert. I've been a hacker uh, and responsible for breaking into a lot of the internet for the last 24 years. Um, and that includes the first stages of the internet with the bulletin boards up until the stuff that we call the World Wide Web today. And along that journey, um, I run a company called SensePost, and we are predominantly a bunch of hackers that get employed by pretty much the who's who of the banking, the intelligence, the military, government, etc., to break in and target and stalk and do everything else that these bad so-called hackers do so they can shore up their defenses. And along that time, I've, I've gained a good insight as to how the internet has changed and how it's enabled standard criminals to make use of the internet for anim anonymity and for also understanding how the criminal networks have evolved because for what we do we need to stay pretty close to those networks and I thought I'd give a rather brief 20 minute, 20 minute introduction as to how that's changed. So cybercrime, um, I, I dislike the term cyber, I just like to call it crime because it's just crime committed using a new medium. Um, at the moment there's a lot of estimates as to how much cybercrime costs um, there's an estimated 275 billion pounds lost annually with regards to crime. Um, for the bulk of that, the G20 nations suffer the bulk of the losses of about 140 billion. And the most important part is most of it goes unreported. Uh, and this is one of the key problems that I think we face today is that at the moment it's all thumb sucking. We have no idea when a company is breached. And with us starting to put every aspect of our lives online, we don't know if that data has been breached or leaked on the internet. Now, McAfee did do an interesting study where they looked at how much crime impacted the GDP of a said country. Now, bear in mind, a lot of this is not reported, so it's very hard to get sure figures. But for the best part, it seems that for most countries, cybercrime itself only amounts to 1% of GDP, which in the grand scheme, grand scale of things isn't much, so why would you worry about it? But interestingly, last week, a rather large occurrence happened. Um, the world's biggest bank heist happened. I'm sure a lot of you have probably ever heard of it, maybe not. Last week, an attempt to steal $100 million from a bank was launched against the Bank of Bangladesh. It didn't make really any front page news, but it was a pretty good attack. Um, so Bank of Bangladesh, their systems were breached using a fairly basic attack. Now it seems that when you report about cyber crimes today, they are always sophisticated, advanced, and really impressive. In my reality and experience, they are not. They are often opportunist attacks. And the ease of attacking banks and individuals and corporations today is shockingly simple. Uh, and that's a, a fact of 20 odd years of breaking into stuff. So interestingly, this attack was only caught because of a spelling mistake, which is quite concerning when you look at the sums involved. Right? Um, and then the other thing, attribution on the internet. At the moment, unknown hackers still managed to get away with about $80 million, right? And as I said, it's one of the largest bank heists in history. So you get to think, well, hang on a minute. If these unknown hackers are able to steal this kind of money, surely we've got protections, we've got law enforcement, we've got intelligence. But the fact of the matter is, a spelling mistake caught this one out. And by all means, these are the ones that are just publicly known about. So what was interesting is, after a month after the attack, right, the officials at the bank are still scrambling to trace the money, shore up security, and identify weaknesses in the systems. And for me, the single statement is systematic of the problem we have with the internet at the moment, is that overall security is very poor, it's too easy to break into stuff, and it's even easier to get away with it. So what is a hacker? Um, I, and I, I speak at a lot of hacking conferences. This is quite interesting. Um, back in the 90s, when we used to all head out to Vegas for a conference called DEF CON, which is the largest gathering of hackers in the world, um, we used to play the game called Spot the Fed. And it was quite easy. Generally, khaki pants, short hair, golf shirts tucked in. Um, unfortunately, that's changed a lot these days. Now it's Spot the Hacker. Um, and stock imagery likes to portray hackers doing really weird things, including wearing glasses and hitting laptops. But what is a hacker today? Um, and for me, the hacking industry is very much like watching a child grow up. Um, there are four key areas I want to concentrate on. There's plenty more. The first would be activists and script kiddies. 
Now, activists could be anything from those against animal testing to those that don't like certain businesses. Script kiddies could be anything from young kids, for example, the kids that took talk talk down, to the curious types, the, the types like me in the 80s, where we're like, well, this is a new thing, what can I do with it? The next big thing are the hacking groups. These are generally the, the teenagers, the kids, the adults who've banded together to decide, right, we want to cause mayhem on the internet. And in more recent years, you might have heard the names called the Syrian Electronic Army and Lizard Squad, unfortunately the team that took down most of the Sony network. Then you have the criminal gangs. Now, for the internet and the criminal gangs, it seems like a match made in heaven. Here you have a platform where everybody can do everything and it's very hard to trace. And then finally, the last group, the group that seems to be causing the most concern, is nation-state attackers. Now, on that note, what's interesting about nation-state attackers is their impact. So in June last year, a certain organization was hacked called the Office of Personal Management. Now, for anybody who's based in the US and has had to go through security clearance, you'll be very familiar with OPM. And you'd think, well, hang on, here's an organization where security should be paramount. But not really. Um, it was the greatest theft of sensitive personal data in history. Security clearance files of 18 million employees was leaked and it included the infamous SF86 form data. So anybody who's been involved in the clearance knows that that is where you bear your soul to that entire form, including fingerprint data. Now currently, they're only guessing where it came from, the normal attribution of saying it was China, but they actually don't have a clue. And this sparks an interest saying, well, if it's this easy to gain, this, gain access to this kind of data, you know, what help do we have on the internet? And I thought I'd step back and look at the evolution of hackers. So this is how it was in the 80s and 90s when we started. Um, you know, the hackers movie kind of did sum up that mood of the era. And like I said, it was like a child growing up, right? So in the 80s and 90s, we were curious. We had this thing called the bulletin boards. There was a loose collection of connected computers. And I sound like my dad now in saying that when we wanted to hack back then, we had to trudge through snow barefoot. There were no books, there were no tools, there was no YouTube. It was a miserable time, all right? We had to learn and read books, which was really awful. Then in the 90s, something amazing happened. So Tim Berners-Lee gave us the World Wide Web. And all of a sudden, loads of companies were going, I need a web presence. I need to have a website with flashing icons saying, under construction, where people can buy my goods. The stock reality was, we were very poor at securing it. And around 2002, I helped start an organization called OWASP, and that was to help better the overall security of web applications at the time. And then in the 2000s, we started to move into criminality. This was kind of when we were writing exploits, we were breaking into systems, and criminals went, actually, we can make some money out of this. It's no longer about the hacking the thing and putting up your favorite picture of a frog or a cow or something else. It's now about, I want to gain access to personal information. I want to gain access to money. And I want to gain access to other boxes so I have the power. And this changed. So from 2003, the web became a very, very ugly place. And that leads us to today, when the FBI has a most wanted for cyber. Again, that horrible words. But if you look at the vast majority of people on the cyber list, these are people that have done fraud, extortion, all your traditional crimes just using the internet. And the main reason they've done this is that the barrier to entry is so much easier. You don't need to spend hours reading a book anymore. In fact, most of the times when we do investigations, the criminals that use the tools didn't know how to use the tool months prior to that. They used YouTube. In fact, most attackers today use YouTube, which is a great resource for learning. But why are we th in this situation, right? And I think it's down to a number of factors. The first is the ease of access and information for these criminal groups. If we take, for example, the ransomware that seems to be blighting the internet at the moment. CryptoLocker, which was probably one of the biggest ones, started off as an initial investment of $18,000. The person who wanted to do it decided he wanted to do this type of crime where he effectively held people's files as ransom. We all know you should back up, but stark realities none of us ever do. And he thought, I don't have the skills. So I'm going to go to a certain marketplace and buy my skills. $18,000, and he made $100 million in 30 days. To date, he has not been arrested or caught. Now, if you look at it from a pure returns perspective, I'm sure most bankers will agree that's a pretty good return, right? 
and you're not going to get caught. So other criminals are now looking at this going, well, this is fantastic. I can go to YouTube or I can pay somebody to do the hard work. This is really easy. The next is the lack of global response to crime. Because I can be based anywhere in the world, and it was already mentioned previously, that crime has moved from a single geographic location to all around the world. So I could be based in an extradition-friendly country and do my attacks from there, knowing that there's a very small chance I will be arrested. And the final thing is there's a massive desire to push everything we do online. Um, I am found out I'm expecting twins, and I've said to my wife that I expect us to have the best North Korea internet experience we can have in the house, because at the moment we do everything online where we are, where we eat, what we do, who we talk to. And it's very easy for criminals to use this and abuse this. So I thought I'd delve into some of the research that we do at SensePurse to look into where these criminal markets grow. Now, there's a lot of talk about these criminal underground markets. There's two key hubs for me. The first one is Russia, and I've termed it criminality as a service. This is for when you have zero technical skills, but you've got a criminal mindset and you need to deploy a certain type of criminal attack using the internet. Now, what Russia have done really well is they've capitalized this. So they now have support networks where if you need to <coughs> buy traditional hacking tools or hacking services, you can go to them, get in touch with the guys, and they provide the whole service for you, pretty much like marketing a PR, right? just for criminals. They also have services like pay per install to drive malicious traffic. What this means is, even if you don't want to get your hands dirty, they will do the hacking for you. So Russia is definitely a leader in this regard. The next big one is Brazil. Brazil, for me, is the global HQ for financial fraud, mostly due to the fact that lax security laws in Brazil means that most criminals today can operate without fear of being caught. I did a talk at a hacking conference there in 2013 and met up with a few of the guys I know, and they turned an amazing concept of, well, let's train criminals, bring them over from the rest of the world, charge five and a half thousand US a day, and we teach you how to install ATM cloners, credit card skimmers, do the normal standard banking style attacks. And they go on a normal course like many of you have, you know, lunch breaks, chatting with your colleagues, hello, my name is Vlad, I'm from Russia, I'm trying to do this type of attack type thing. And it works really, really well. So if you look at the financial fraud that's coming out on the marketplace today, Brazil's generally where it's happening. And often, they offer training support for criminals. So these are the two areas that are driving a lot of the fraud today. Now, what do these places offer? All right, so if you've spent a lot of time in the criminal markets, and generally they're not as easy as a lot of people like to, you to think, you have to gain access, you've got to be vetted. They offer a whole lot of different products and services. And indeed, there's not just one big market, there's a number of markets, depending on what you want. The first is malware, right? pieces of malicious code that bypass system security and systems a person's machine. Now, I'm no betting man, but I hedge a bet and say that the Bangladesh bank attack was generally done by some many stalking key individuals sending a malicious email, bypassing their security defenses, and dropping a piece of malware on a machine, the same way that we would attack a bank. The next one are exploits and exploit frameworks. So you hear about vulnerabilities in software in the, all the time. Well, how do you exploit that? How do you gain access? You now have frameworks and exploits that people code up just as you would software packages and sell access to that. For example, an exploit in the latest iOS bug will probably sell for about a million dollars. That will gain full access to Apple's iOS, and I'm sure the FBI would love to pay for that at the moment. The next thing is cryptos. So we all turn, you know, hear the stories, use antivirus. Well, there's criminal gangs out, out there that sell services to bypass antivirus. Again, you want your exploit and you want your payload to work. Then you have your more traditional means of crime, fake documents, passports, credit card, loan applications, etc. Then credit cards and credentials. Now, a lot of people say to me, so what if somebody knows what my Gmail password is? Actually, that information is gold. I go back to my point where everybody puts their life online today. Generally, the one thing that ties you all together will be your email address. If I gain access to your email address, it gives me four hours to gain access to your entire digital life. So these credentials are worth a lot of money. And then finally, as would anything in the cloud, we've moved everything into the cloud and an IT level, so have criminals, right? So they use Amazon's EC2 instance. They use other platforms so that you can have your cloud criminal service. 
And finally, for those who just don't have the skills, you've got your traditional hacking services. So you don't know how to breach a network, you don't know how to gain access to credentials, you can pay somebody to do that. And this all culminated in an amazing piece of investigation I was involved in last year. Now, the market for stolen credit card information is not new. Normally how it would work is the carding forums would either be on the dark web or they'd be vetted access only. What was interesting in November last year is we came across a website called bestvalid.cc where these criminals decided, you know what, throw caution to the wind, we don't care. We are going to sell credit cards on the internet where anybody can access and we're going to use cloud-based services. You can join up, you can buy most credit cards for about a dollar a piece and we're also going to offer you the chance to check that that credit card hasn't been stopped yet. And this site was operating without any worry in the world. The two people were based in Romania and Russia. Very, very happy that they weren't going to be stopped. And we found about 150,000 British credit card information details on there, including home address, email address, and phone number. And we worked with the Times, and they called up three people there and said, can we buy your details back? And she was more shocked that her home address and email address was listed there than the fact that her credit card address was being sold. So criminals just don't care anymore because it's, it's very easy to do. So how do we solve this? And this is me coming at it from a, a pure hacking background, somebody who's been involved in this offensive industry for a long time. There's three things we'd love to see. The first is from a government, laws that reflect the changing pace of technology and how we use the internet. Laws like the Computer Misuse Act are still horribly outdated. And indeed, there's an issue where laws can't keep up with the pace of technology but something has to change. The next big thing is one I'm very, very passionate about is mandatory breach, no breach notification. I think in this day and age, when people's lives are online, it's no longer up to a company to inform the world that they've been breached and they've lost information. Because we see on a regular basis, databases of very, very personal information that's leaked on these card forums and you never hear anything in the news. And indeed, a study said in 2013, they reckoned about 800 million pieces of information was breached without any reports in the news. Then finally, better global cooperation. It's too easy for criminals to set up a best valid CC website hosted on the normal internet and sell credit cards <coughs> and not worrying about being stopped. And then finally, a systematic effort to collect and publish data on cybercrime. So prior to this talk, I thought I'd write to all the police departments and do a freedom of information request to see how many cyber crimes were committed in 2015. Um, damn near all of them said they don't carry that kind of data. Only the City of London Police got back to me and said there were 87, which if I believe those statistics is staggering because in the whole City of London Police there were only 87 crimes, doesn't seem right. At a law enforcement level, um, it was interesting to hear the, the professor talk. Um, one of the things that I'd love to see is treating cybercrime as any other crime. I think we've moved away from the fact where it needs a special name and a special term. It's just crime. There's no other way around it. If you steal some of these details or you steal the wallet, it's the same thing online. And being part of the standard police responsibility. Um, I appreciate that there's individual <laughs> cyber units, and I, I know quite a few of the guys in the cyber units, but having standard police officers being able to understand what a crime is on the internet and being able to do basic level investigations. And a key thing is training and skills investment. Right? There aren't enough police officers with these skills and capability to start stopping this tide. And then finally, the big thing that could stop a lot of the crimes happening is that of corporate responsibility. In 2016, it's a sad state that the vast majority of the internet is still horribly insecure. And it is too easy for criminals to gain access. For example, TalkTalk. Talk. TalkTalk Talk had bre been breached twice before that. The attack against TalkTalk Talk was embarrassing and there was no neat read for it. Um, there needs to be a shift in importance of how we view security. Security for me has always been the end part of the game, whereas it needs to be the beginning part. If you put your stuff online, it should be secure. And then finally, better protection for personally identifi identifiable information. So thank you very much. <laughs>